So welcome back. Uh, we started talking about the chi-square and in the previous video we discussed the methodology and techniques of running the Pearson chi-square where you had uh, multiple groups but the group's members were independent and your outcome was categorical and therefore your null hypothesis was testing if proportion in group one equal proportion in group two. If you had more than two groups, then it's proportion in group three, etc. Uh, in this video, we're going to discuss the, um, the chi-square McNamara, which is used when the group members in group one and in group two are equivalent. And we're limiting ourselves to the situation of having only two groups. If you have more than two groups, you would need um, to do uh, something different than uh, the, the McNamara. You would have to use the the Cochrane few, which I already mentioned that we're not going to be using. So if you remember, this is the, um, this is the map of the tests. And um, we're going to discuss two groups. The outcome is categorical, but the group members are dependent. And therefore, uh, we're going to use the McNamara chi-square. OK, so uh, let's go over the lecture. So I start you off with a scenario that says a researcher was interested in knowing if movies affect people's opinions about life issues. So what he did, he planned an experiment in which he recruited 60 volunteers, asked them if they were against or in favor of abortion, okay? And it happened that 35 were against abortion and 25 were in favor. So if you add 35 to 25, you'll get the 60. So what he did next is that he asked them to watch a movie dealing with the subject of abortion. And at the end, he asked them again about their opinion. And this time, uh, 25 that were in favor. So remember, you had 35 that were against and 25 that were in favor. OK, so out of this 25 right here, 15 changed their opinion. Okay, so now they are uh, against. Whereas out of the 35 that were against, five changed their opinion and became in favor. Okay, so uh, you have, if, you, if, if we have to ask ourselves the three famous, famous question, how many groups do we have? Well, the grouping here is before the movie and after the movie. So it's two groups and we're interested in whether they are in favor or against, and hence uh, favor or against, this is categorical. But since it's the same people, so he's asking the same people before and the same people after, so uh, these are dependent groups, and therefore we're going to use the McNamara. Okay, so uh, research question and hypothesis. Is there evidence that watching a movie changes people's attitude towards a life issue such as abortion? Step number one, we're going to write our null hypothesis. So proportion against abortion before equal proportion against abortion after. And the alternative hypothesis, uh, there are different. So these two are different. You can write these two and put a uh, not equal sign between the two, okay? Um, so this is the easiest way to write your null hypothesis. I always mention that there is another way to write your null hypothesis, which is not very easy sometimes to understand how it works. So I'm just going to mention it, but you don't really have to worry about it too much. This is if the proportion changing opinion from against abortion to in favor of abortion is equal to the proportion of those changing opinion from being in favor of abortion to against abortion. Okay. Now, yeah, sometimes people find it hard to think about what we're saying in this setup. So just you can write it up like this. It's perfectly fine. Okay. All right, um, one last thing. Um, some students are, um, they wonder like, why are we testing the proportion against abortion? Why are we not testing the proportion of being in favor of abortion? It's exactly the same thing, okay? So every time you have a categorical outcome, yes or no, you can pick which, which of the two is your success and you will work with it. So here I'm, I'm interested in against abortion equal against abortion after. 
this is exactly the same thing as doing in favor of abortion before equal in favor of abortion afterwards. And the results are just going to be exactly the same because if you think about it, if I have evidence that the proportion against this change from before to after, well, that automatically means that the proportion of in favor changed. Okay. All right. So um, to set up the table for this situation, we have to think about pairs of individuals. So what happened is that at the beginning, you had 25 that were in favor. So this is the before right here. And you have 35 that were against. And then what happened is that out of these 25, uh, 10 remained in favor and 15 changed their opinion. And out of the 35 that were against, 30 remain against and 5 changed their opinion. Okay? So see these numbers, the 10, the 15, the 30, and the 5? These are your four cells, your ABC cells. Okay? So the way we're going to set up the table this time is that we're going to have the before and the after. And then the before goes into in favor against and the after is going to go in favor and against. And what you're going to have here is the pairs of data. What I mean by that is the following. See these 10 individuals? Well, these are the 10 that were in favor before and in favor after, okay? So it's like a pair, favor, favor, they didn't change. And these 30 individual right there, those were the against, against, they did not change their opinion. Whereas the 15 right there, these were the people that were in favor, but changed their opinion to against. So we talk about the changes or disconcordance here, okay? Because before was something and after became something else. And also another set of disconcordant pair are these fives. They were against and they became in favor afterwards. Notice that the table is a total of only 60. I know I'm 60 before, and 60 after but the to but the table is a total of 60 because we set it up so that what you have here is pairs of observation okay so these 10 people they were asked the question twice but we're only plugging them in this cell because this is the cell that have in favor and favor etc okay so if you want to know what was the percentage that were against before so this is the before right and this is the against. Now the total against before came of 35. So 35 divided by 60, that's 58.3%. Whereas the percentage against after, so again, this is the after right here. So this is the uh, against. You go all the way down to 45 and 45 over 60, it's going to give you 75. Okay, so basically what happened, 58.3% were against before, and that percentage went up to 75%. And therefore, we want to know if this change is statistically significant or not. Also, you can think about um, percentage of, of changing opinion. So the percents that change their opinion from against to in favor, so Kano against, and then they became in favor afterwards, so Holil after, Sar in favor, that's five. So that's five out of 60. So 8.3% change their opinion from against abortion to in favor of abortion. Whereas the percentage that change their opinion from being favored, la against, so in the before, Keno in favor, and the after they became against, that's 15. 15 out of 60, that's 25%. So again, uh, you're asking yourself, is the difference in these two percentages statistically significant? Okay? Tazim, so once you set up this table, your McNamara chi-square is the following. It is the, C the B cell minus the C cell. You square that difference between these two, okay? Then you do a minus one. This minus one is a correction term that was introduced later on. An earlier version of the McNamara, McKin free had minus one. But anyway, you don't have to worry about it. Just, you know, you do a minus one, and then you divide by B plus C. Notice in the entire formula, A U D cell are not part of it. And it is up to Zakarul A will D cell. These are the concordant cells. Yani those that did not change from before and after. 
those that did not change from before and after are not part of your calculations. Only those that changed are part of your calculation. And these are the B cell and the C cell. So once again, B minus C. C2 is a C or a B. It doesn't matter because you're going to square. Then do your minus 1. And then you divide by B plus C. Okay? Schull degrees of freedom. Well, it's the same degrees of freedom formula we've been using for the Pearson Chrysler, which happens to be 1. So every time we're going to do a McNamara, which is before or after, with only two possibilities, your degrees of freedom is going to be 1. Tapshur requirement, remember with the Pearson chi-square, the requirement you had to count the expected and see how many of the expected were greater than 5. Well, here it's simply B plus C has to be greater than 10. So this value plus that value have to be greater than or equal to 10. So it's, it's, it's much, much simpler. Okay, so let's go and calculate the McNamara chi-square for our example. So remember, the whole 10 and whole 30 are not going to be part of our calculation. We're only going to focus on the 15 and the 5 because these are the people that change their opinion. So you do 15 minus 5, that gives you 10. 10, you square it. This is a square. I'm going to correct that. I hope I can correct that. Okay, so it's five, 15 minus 5 is square, okay, so that's 10, 10 squared is 100, then you take out 1, so 100 minus 1, and you divide by 15 plus 5, that's 20, so you get 99 divided by 20, that's 4.95, okay, Shukin el requirement, your requirement is to check that the B cell plus the C cell together are greater than uh, 10 and it is look it's 20 20 is actually greater than tw 10 so you meet the requirement so what's the degrees of freedom for this McNamara chi-square well it's one and how do I get the p-value well let's go back to our same exact chi-square table we were using in the Pearson chi-square right here okay so that's degrees of freedom one you start looking for value 4.95 and it happens that it's between these two values, between the 3.841 and the 6.635. That means that your p-value is between 1% and 5%. So it's very simple, straightforward, easy to calculate. Okay, so we're back here. So our p-value is between 1 and 5%. So what does that mean? It means we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Again, rejecting the null hypothesis is called your um, statistical conclusion. So what is going to be your research conclusion? The difference between the proportion of people against abortion before and after viewing the movie is statistically significant. And if there is a change in opinion, and that change that we observed is statistically significant. We can say that the movie has increased the proportion of people against abortion. So how do I know that the proportion against abortion increased? Well, if you go back a few slides back, we remember we calculated the proportions. Well, the proportion against Abdel movie can 58.3, bad the movie 75. So that change in, in, in opinion, that change is statistically significant. We can also say that the proportion of people changing their mind is statistically higher among those going from in favor to against than those going from against to in favor. Again, this is the, the second way to think about it. And if you're not comfortable with that second way, that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. All I want you to know is the first way. Okay, so uh, last is again one of those scenarios where I'm going to talk about power. If we were, if uh, you were told that you made an error, what type would it be? Okay, so let's go back to our paint, and I'm going to set again the uh, the table that you should know by heart now. Okay, so this is where the null hypothesis is correct. And this is where the null hypothesis is false. And remember, this is reality, okay? You don't know that unless 
I tell you something about it, okay? Here on this side is your test, and your test is either going to fail to reject the null hypothesis or reject the null hypothesis. And out of that, you either get the one minus alpha situation or the alpha situation, which is also called the type one error. Here, this is your type two error, also known as beta. And this is your one minus beta, also known as tau, okay? All right, so what do we know in our situation? Well, we know that we rejected. Since we rejected, we either committed a type one error or we achieved power, okay? So when I say to you, you made an error, what error could it be? Well, it cannot be but type one error, okay? So once you reject, there is no way that you made type two error. It has to be type one error. So if I do a follow up and I ask you, well, if you know that you made a type one error, that what does it say about the reality of the null? Well, it says that in reality, the null is, is true. Shumanita, the null is true in that specific example. It means people opinion do not change after watching movie. We just had a situation where we, we reached an, uh, a, a mistake, uh, a wrong conclusion, okay? So going back to the question, if we were told that you made an error, what type would it be? Since we rejected the null hypothesis, it must be a type one error. Type, another question, if you were told that you made the right decision, that what, uh, uh, what does it say about the reality of the null? Okay, so again, I'm back here, and remember again, we rejected the null. Now, if my decision of rejecting the null is the correct decision, then it has to be power, okay? It means I achieved power. And if I achieve power, then what does it say about the reality of the null? It says that the reality of the null is false. Yani anjat people change their opinion. And my study was able to detect that change. Okay? So since we rejected the null, uh, it was a correct decision. And that's the reality of the null that it was false. Okay? So here's... Um, the uh, the Pearson chi-square test, sorry, the McNamara chi-square. And with this lecture, we would have concluded all the um, chi-squares. So Pearson chi-square, we talked about it in the previous lecture. In this lecture, we talked about the McNamara chi-square. We're not going to talk about the Cochrane Q chi-square. And what we're left with is a situation where you're going to have three or more groups, but your outcome of interest is numerical. And here we're going to use one of the two ANOVAs. So Yama ANOVA with blocks, Yama ANOVA without block. All right? So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and see you soon with uh, a newer lecture.